that's okay. They say competition's good. <laughs> I know, I know. I know what you meant. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Glad to see everyone's here this morning and hopefully you all enjoyed the extra hour of sleep in if you got it. I know some people with kids missed out, but in a, in a way I think you've sort of brought that upon yourself. <laughs> I, better be, I better be quiet now before I give myself a bigger, to- bigger <laughs> hold there. <laughs> Let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we once again thank you that we can meet together uh, this morning and we thank you that we can enjoy the fellowship and the praises and now, Lord, uh, to sit and hear a message from your word. Lord, I ask that you would just calm my nerves and that you would just uh, strengthen me and uh, give me the wisdom and understanding I need to preach the truth. Lord, I ask that you just prepare all our hearts and our minds for the message, that we would put aside distractions and be able to listen and understand and apply it to our lives and in Jesus name amen Amen. Uh, turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 21 John chapter 21 I was pondering whether or not I should go back to Ezekiel but I decided um, with the Lord's leading that seeing as we just had Easter we'll go to a passage that of some things that happened after Christ rose from the dead So John chapter 21 and we begin reading in verse 15. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me he saith unto him yea lord thou knowest that i love thee he saith unto him feed my sheep he saith unto him the third time simon son of jonas lovest thou me peter was grieved because he had said unto him the third time lovest thou me and he said unto him lord thou knowest all things thou knowest that i love thee jesus saith unto him feed my sheep Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, Follow me. Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved, following, which also leaned on his breast at supper, and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren that the, that disciple should not die. Yet Jesus said unto him, He shall not die, but if I will, ta- will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? As I said, this is a, an event that happened after Jesus rose from the dead and after he had already met his disciples several occasions and he told them that he was going to go to Galilee and that they should head to Galilee to meet him. And they go out and after, as they're waiting, they go out and go fishing and they're not catching anything. And then Jesus arrives on the shore and tells them to cast their net once more and they catch a multitude of fish. And as they come in, they have a meal with Christ. This is to be their last meal with him. And we here have a discourse between Christ and Peter. I'm sure you're all very familiar with with this passage. How it draws a comparison to the three times that Peter denied Christ before his death. There is a lot in this passage and our English doesn't uh, convey it very 
openly, <laughs> I'm sorry to say. Our English language is not very uh, advanced language. It's a very simple language at times. So to help us get a, bit of understand, a better understanding of this passage, I'd just like to go th- through a few things first. When Christ asks Peter whether Peter loves him, the first two times he asks, he asks that you, with the agape love. Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He asks Peter, do you love me with agape love more than these? Do you love me? Do you agape love me? Now for those who don't know, the agape love is a general or wide love. It's a sacrificial love. It's also an unconditional love towards others. When God said he loved the world, this is the love that he used. When we are told to love our enemies, this is the love that we are to show. To love our neighbours. This is the love that we are to show. This is this unconditional love. A love that doesn't expect anything back. A love that is simply shown for the sake of showing. Out of care. And passion. And Peter each time responds with, Lord, you know us that I love thee. However, the love that Peter uses is a different love. He responds with the phileo love. This love means is usually the friendly love, the love between friends. It means to be a friend, to have affection for. And it also means to kiss. It's that type of affection. That brotherly love, that friendly love. It denotes a personal attachment. So as Christ asks Peter, do you love me unconditionally? Peter responds, I love you like a friend. This word is used throughout the scriptures. It's used when Christ denotes the love of the, of the Pharisees when they stand up praying. It's used when, when Christ says, He that loveth father or mother more than me. But it's also used when Christ says, For the father loveth the son. But as I said, this word is also means to kiss. And if we go, or if we were to go to when we have Judas Iscariot kissing our Lord to identify him, This is actually the same word used. They're two different types of love. And when Christ asks this question, he has three he has different questions he asks. Firstly, he asks Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? These being the disciples. He asked Peter, do you love me more than the other disciples, Peter? Do you love me more than these who you have spent years with, that you have got to know, that you went and fled to and hid with when I died? Do you love me more than these, Peter? Peter responds, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. Then Christ's second question to Peter was, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Firstly, he asked whether he loved Christ more than the disciples. Now he asks him directly, lovest thou me? And Simon responded, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And the third question that Christ asks here, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? This word love is the phileo love. This is not the agape love. As I said, our English doesn't convey it very well, but there is a difference here. So Christ once more asks him, Simon, do you love me like a friend? Do you love me? Do you care for me? Are you attached? Mm-hmm. 
And Peter is distressed. He is grieved by being asked this question. Whether it was the change of the word love or whether it was because it was the third time he asked, Peter was grieved. He was distressed. He was brought to sorrow. His heart was full of heaviness. He was grieved. And he responds, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Now again, the two knows here is different. I told you our English language is, not, is simple. There are two different Greek words used here for the word no. In verse 15, 16, and the first time the word no is used in verse 17, the word ido in the Greek is used. It means to see, to know, to be aware of. So when Christ asked, Simon, do you love me? He responded with, Lord, you see that I love you. You're aware that I love you. But the third time he asks, the response is different. Lord, you see or you, you are aware of all things. You knowest all things. You see all things. You know all things. You understand. You are, you are aware of all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. This know is the gnosko love. This word means to know, to, to understand, to have knowledge. It's not just simply to see, but to know the heart of someone. To know deeply that Peter loved Christ. Christ wasn't asking, Peter, do you show love? He was asking, Peter, do you love me? And thrice Peter denied the Lord and now thrice the Lord asks him, does he love him? And Peter's grief after the third one leads him to declare, Christ, you see all things and you know my love for you is genuine. Even though in the past I suffered weakness, moments of weakness, even though I stumbled, you know that I love you. So this three, three questions brings to my, Peter's mind the time he failed. And his failure revealed areas to him that he needed to address to better serve God. Christ was about to send him and the rest of the disciples out to preach the gospel. And there were certain things that Peter needed to address so that he could better serve in that task. See, Peter was overzealous at times. When they came to arrest Christ, he was the first to draw a sword and cut off the servant's ear. He was overzealous. He wasn't afraid at that point because he had a sword in his hand. He was willing to lash out, perhaps out of love to protect his saviour. When Christ forbade him to do so, and told him to put away the sword. We see that Peter then falls into a state of cowardice. He goes along with Christ, following to where Christ would be judged. And three times he is asked, were you not with Christ? Or were you not with this Jesus? Were you not one of those who are with him? And three times he denies and by the third time, his temper rises. He swears, he curses, I never knew the man. He's overzealous. He had a streak of cowardness and he had a temper. And he had to address these things. There was a lesson that God can and regularly, there's a lesson here that God can and does regularly use those who have failed in their past to serve him in the future, to complete great works. Peter wasn't discarded because he failed here. Neither were any of the other disciples. 
Their faults were addressed so they could better serve Christ. You know, we are no better than Peter at times. It's not hard to search through our lives and find places where we have failed, where we have been at fault, where God has revealed to us a weakness. Requires humility to deal with those things, to deal with those problems. And before God can use us, we need to be able to see those problems and address them. God knows the hearts of men. He sees more than what we can see. He knows ourselves better than we do. He knows what mistakes we've made. He's willing to forgive. He's willing to show love. But we need to be willing to humbly submit. To cleanse ourselves of our past errors. To put aside those things. To better serve God. Now Christ gives, or gave Peter three commands. Feed my lambs, feed my sheep, and feed my sheep. Peter said that I love thee, and Christ said, feed my lambs. Now it's very important here to understand Christ's love for his sheep. He would not let anyone, or just anyone, care for the sheep unless he knew that they would love them as much as he loved them. He would not let just anyone rule over his sheep unless he knew that that person was more in love with him than anyone else. And again, the word feed here in each command is different at times. The first word of feed my lambs means to feed or graze, keep or pasture. It means look after them. Make sure they get fed. Of course, we have lambs, you know, the young ones. In reference, it may be referring to feed the other disciples, Peter. They're young. You'll have to look after them a bit. And we do see Peter at times taking on a bit of a leadership role amongst the other disciples. And this brings us to the second command, feed my sheep. And this feed is actually different to the last feed. This means to tend as a shepherd, to feed or to rule. Here Peter is told to rule over the sheep, to tend to them like a shepherd, guide them where they need to go, defend them as you would, as a king would his people. Feed my sheep. As Christianity would develop and move from lambs to sheep, they would need a shepherd. Now Christ is the great shepherd. But there would have to be under shepherds, those who would serve and look out for the flock. Turn with me to John chapter 10. John chapter 10, chapter 10, and we'll begin reading in verse 1. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief but and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. 
This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever come or came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth them. The hireling fleeth, because he is an hireling, and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. The hireling have no love for the sheep. The Christ does. And now he is entrusting his sheep to Peter. That's why he had to make sure that Peter would love his sheep. He also had to make sure that the weaknesses of Peter had to be addressed. You see, if the shepherd is overzealous, chasing away the wolf, a bear may come while he's away. If the shepherd is a coward and runs away when the threat arrives, the sheep are devoured. If the shepherd has a temper and the sheep do as sheep do and scatter or go where he doesn't want them to, he may harm the sheep if in, in that temper. Be a shepherd requires a level head, re- requires courage, requires patience. We have been saved, but that salvation comes with the expectation of service. And here, Peter is given his expectation of service to care for the sheep. Not just the sheep in Jerusalem, but the sheep from the other fold that would be brought in, the Gentiles, the Samaritans. He needed to love all the sheep that Christ would bring to his fold. And the talents given to him through trials, they would help him and mould him to assist and assist him in that service. Peter before was willing to go with Christ to die on the cross. And Christ told him, not yet, Peter. Now is not the time. Moving into verse 18, Christ now reveals to Peter how his life will end. Verily, verily, I say unto you, thee, unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. Here Christ tells Peter, Peter, when you are younger, Even now, you can dress yourself. You can decide where to go. But service requires sacrifice. When you're older, your hands will be stretched out and they will be bound. And you'll be taken where you don't want to go. Certainly very few people ever wanted to go to the cross. And according to church tradition, Peter himself was crucified upside down. 
believing himself unworthy to die in the same manner that Christ himself died. Peter was willing to follow his Saviour all the way to the cross. In verse 19, this spake he signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, follow me. These were familiar words to Peter. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, and starting in verse 18. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said unto them, Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. These are the wor first words that Christ said to Peter, Follow me. Turn with me to Mark in chapter 8. And verse 34, Mark chapter 8 and verse 34. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Here again those familiar words, follow me. In reference here, Christ is even telling the people and his disciples, there is sacrifice in following me. You have to deny yourself and you have to take up your cross. In other places we are told that this is a daily sacrifice, to take up thy cross daily. Back in John chapter 10, it is my sheep hear my voice and follow me. But perhaps more than all of these, John chapter 13 perhaps was what brought Peter to, or this, this um, to mind for Peter. John chapter 13 and we'll begin reading in verse 31. <coughs> Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. Little children, yet a little while, and I am with you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, Whither I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. Peter was willing to go with his Lord. Where, wherever Christ was going, Peter was willing to go. And Christ replied, You cannot follow me now. And now Christ has turned to him and said, Follow me. Now, Peter, is the time to follow. Now is the time to come. Peter was willing to go, but he was not ready to go. Now Christ calls him to follow. We are reminded of Moses who went out to free his people before his time and ended up slaying the Egyptian and having to go into hiding in the wilderness. Likewise, Peter, though willing to go, was not ready to go. And now Christ calls him to follow. 
And we too are called to follow Christ, to daily deny ourselves and to daily pick up our cross and follow him. We are told to be the light of the world or to be cities that are set on a hill for all to see. We ought to be ready to follow Christ down the same road that he took to, the, to Golgotha to take up our cross and follow him. That service requires sacrifice, is the expectation. And as Peter and Christ are having this discussion, Peter turns and sees John approaching. In verse 20, Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved, following, which also leaned on the breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter sees John coming. Now, we're not told much about the relationship between Peter and John, whether there was some rivalry between the two. They certainly did seek the favour of Christ and would seem to be in competition for it. I mean, we also know that there were disputes amongst the disciples as to who would be the, his favourite. Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 to 24 tells us that. It uh, tells us of one such dispute. And now, I have no inside knowledge of this, but I'd almost character, characterise Peter and John's rivalry as a mimicry of Mary and Martha's. Turn with me to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, and we'll start reading in verse 38. <clears throat> now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving, and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Both Mary and Martha love the Lord. And Martha went about showing that love through service and Mary showed that love by sitting at Jesus' feet. And we could almost see that same type of relationship with Peter and John. John would sit at Jesus' feet. He would go out and serve but he would love to sit with Jesus. Peter was always willing to serve always willing to go the extra mile, running around, cumbered with much service. It is these two that ran to the tomb when they were told Christ's body was missing. And by Acts chapter 3, it seems that rivalry may have somewhat ended when we're told that Peter and John went up to the temple to pray together. There's no animosity there. And Peter sees John coming and he has a question, and what shall this man do? Now we're not told what is in Peter's mind at this time, whether it's simple curiosity, whether it was a, the, some re rivalry that was between the two men, or whether it was gen genuine concern. But he asked Jesus, what shall this man do? Now we're not sure whether he's asking, what shall be this man's end? We're not sure whether he's asking, what service have, will you have John do? As if he's trying to compare himself and what Christ has set for, for him. And Jesus doesn't answer the question Instead, he gives a three-part answer. Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? If 
follow thou me. He first tells Peter, Peter, it doesn't matter. If I will, if I will that he tarry till I come, if I will that he tarry till I come, Peter, I have a job for you and I have a job for John. Why are you concerned about it? If I tarry till I, if he, if I will that he tarry till I come, in verse twenty three indicates that this actually became a saying among some of the believers, thinking that John would be alive till Christ until Christ returned. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren that that disciple should not die. Yet Jesus said not unto him he shall not die, but if I will ta- that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? How easy it is to twist the words of our Lord, to take them out of context. And John himself sets this as a way of correcting the account. However, one could also perhaps see a hint of the Lord's sense of humour in this. Who was it that wrote Revelations? Who was it that got to see the events that were going to come at the end of the church age that would record when Christ would would return what would happen and what would happen afterwards? God has a sense of humour, I believe. But he asks uh, Peter, what is that to thee? Why are you concerned with others, Peter? Why are you worried about John and not yourself? How quickly our focus shifts from our Saviour to others. How quickly do we get distracted by what others are doing? Or how God has blessed others or given others a job to do. We might look at another church and see all their chairs full. We might see a myriad of preachers ready to preach. Choirs to sing. And we might look at those churches and wonder why can't we have that? We might look at others and wonder why do they get blessed and I don't. We need to focus not on others but on Christ. Sure, we show concern for others, but our focus should remain on Christ. And Christ says, follow thou me. Stay focused on me, Peter. Don't get distracted. Don't let envy grow in you. Don't worry about what others are doing. Worry about what you're doing. Worry about what I have called you to do. We are told about the wise and unwise servants in Luke chapter 19. We are told that those who are faithful in very little were given much for, as a reward. Likewise, when we are given little, we need to be faithful in that little. Not comparing ourselves to what others are doing, but rather what the Lord is doing in us. If we worry ourselves over what the Lord is doing in other people's lives, we can grow envious. And that envy can make us lose sight of Christ and the path that he has set for us. Usually such concerns are often born out of our own pride. We we are much happier when we are humbly following after Christ in the path that he has set for us. We need to stop and ask ourselves, are we seeking God's glory or our own glory? Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and just verses 5 to 7. Who then is Paul 
and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. We serve because it is a, we love our Saviour. We follow after him. We need to focus ourselves on our own work and do it diligently, not for ourselves or our own glory, but for God. We are here to serve our Saviour. We are here to do it humbly, not seeking reward, not seeking praise and glory and honour, but our prayer should ever be that all praise, glory and honour go to our Saviour, who has gone before us, who set the path, who walked at first and now has gone to prepare a place at the finish line for each of us. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have loved us even when we fail you. And Lord, we ask that you would just help us to put aside our mistakes of the past and to serve you more faithfully. Lord, help us to see where we are failing or we have weakness and Lord help us to correct those things help us to put aside our own pride and any envy that we have for others and help us to be satisfied with you help us to follow after you faithfully in all things and in Jesus name Amen <laughs>